Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So these last few weeks, we've given up quite a bit. We've given up control. We've given up some expectations. And if you expect to keep on giving up control, you have my cheering. Because I know I'm having trouble with it. But we're going to journey on that together. This week, we're talking about giving up superiority. Now, there's two different kinds of superiority. There is a subjective superiority, which is my opinion matters more than yours. And there's an objective superiority. Things just rank out according to numbers. Now, an objective superiority, you think about it, you have a team that has a winning record. You have so many wins, so many losses, so many ties. The team might not necessarily be a better team, but they have a superior winning record. Now, has anybody been paying attention to the big ski races going on this last weekend? Yeah, Michaela Schifrin has been ski racing. And it's really hard to tell the clock. The clock doesn't know what time it is. When you rank up the times when the skiers cross the finish line, that's an objective superiority. You've got one who comes in first place, one who comes in second place, one that comes in third place. It's all based on when the ski crosses the line. That's not the superiority we're talking about today. The superiority we're talking about today is the subjective superiority. I think that my team is better than your team simply because it's my team. I think that this is better because it's my opinion. I think that this group of people is a better group of people for some earthly, human-created reason. That's what we're giving up. And we're given a really good uh, example today of how to do that in John's Gospel. For you see, we see Jesus come into this town and come to a well and he sits down and he starts talking to a woman there. And at first, it doesn't seem that odd because, well, Jesus, Jesus talks to women. That's just what Jesus does. But what makes this so unique is that Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. Samaritan. Samaritan. There's something in there about Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. Okay, Good Samaritan. We think about that from Luke's Gospel, where the Samaritan helps the man who has been hurt and has passed by by everybody else. And we think about the Good Samaritan laws, which are named after that parable, which protect people who try to do what is right by someone who has been hurt or is in some kind of trouble. But a Samaritan is a little bit more than just somebody who does good. Actually, a Samaritan is somebody who, okay, stick with me here, is from what is formerly known as the Northern Kingdom of Israel. So, backstory. David, King David, remember King David, David and Goliath? He became king. King David had a son, Solomon. Solomon. Solomon was the king where the two mothers came with the baby and he had to decide who the baby belonged to. That's Solomon. When Solomon died, his two of his sons couldn't decide who was king. So what did they do? They divided the kingdom in half. You had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. In the northern kingdom of Israel, you had the Assyrian Empire come in. In about 700 BC, they took over. They took all the really smart people, all the really rich people, basically everybody they didn't, everybody they thought was worth something, and they carted them off to the Assyrian Empire. And everybody who was left started intermarrying with other locals, and the people who descended from them were known as the Samaritans. Basically, the Assyrians did what the Babylonians did but only a hundred years before. They were the real original guys. So, the Samaritans lived in the north. Now the Jewish people looked at the Samaritans and they thought of them as kind of half-breeds. 
half calf, not quite as good as the Jews. And so, for Jesus to come and to sit and talk with a Samaritan woman, oh, it's just not done. But here's the other reason why it was really a mind-shattering thing for a Jewish man to be talking to a Samaritan woman. The Jewish people believed that God dwelt in the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Remember the, remember the, man, the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem? That's what's left over of the Temple Mount from Jesus' time. That's where the Jews believe that God lives. The Samaritans, however, believe that God lives on Mount Gerizim, which is in that northern province of Israel. They're arguing over where God lives. Sounds kind of like a familiar problem. So, for Jesus, a Jewish man who is a teacher, a respected individual, to come into town and talk with a Samaritan woman would be like a Catholic and a Protestant in Northern Ireland in the 90s coming together and having a conversation. It would be like a Bedouin and a Muslim coming together and having a conversation. It would be like two members of rival gangs coming together and having a conversation. It doesn't happen. But then Jesus does what Jesus does. So Jesus comes and he has this conversation with her. And it's not just the conversation of, would you please get me a glass of water, which in and of itself is odd. You would think he would say, hey, please, water, now. But Jesus not only asks her for water, he begins to teach her. He tells her about himself, about what God has promised, and that God is fulfilling that promise in himself. He teaches her on an equal level. He meets her where she is at. And that, my friends, is what giving up superiority means. He had every reason to act with a superior attitude. He had every reason to think that he had um, the ability to be better than her because the world told him that he did. And yet Jesus meets her where she's at. Now think about it. What does the woman do after she has this conversation with Jesus? She goes... And she goes into town, and she says to people, come and meet this man that I've met, who told me everything I have ever done. Could he be the Messiah? Do you think that she would have done that if Jesus had been superior to her? If Jesus had treated her as less than? Probably not. Because Jesus looked at her as an equal, treated her as an equal, she invites others to come, to meet him, to know him, to learn from him, and brings about a huge conversion of people to knowing that Jesus is the promised Messiah and the Savior of the world. Jesus did this by giving up superiority. And it brings to mind to me this meme I saw on Facebook this week. And this meme said this, there is not a pair of eyes that you can look into that God does not love. Let me say that again. There is not a pair of eyes that you can look into that do not belong to someone that God does not love. God loves each of us. God loves those who the world thinks are great and those who the world thinks are horrible. God loves those whom the world celebrates, and God loves those who the world reviles. God loves each and every one of us equally, fully, and joyfully. You will never look into the eyes of someone that God does not love. We are all on the same plane, my friend, whether or not we think we are. That, my friends, is giving up superiority. 
you will never look into the eyes of someone that God did not offer the gift of salvation to through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. You will never look into the eyes of someone that God has not offered the gift of grace to. For God offers that gift freely and openly to each and every person with no strings attached. God does not say, well, if you've done all these right things and if you've given to all these right causes, then you can have this gift. No, God offers it freely. God has given up that superiority. Even though of all, God is the one who is most deserving of being superior. God humbled himself and came to earth as a baby a human infant, and lived among us. He came not to be served, but to serve. That is giving up superiority. And I know sometimes it can be really hard to translate these theological ideas and these ideas that come from Bible stories into our own lives, so I want to share with you a relatively connected to our own time idea. And I say relative because it did happen in 1865, but I think it will hit at the heart of what we're getting at today. Now, for those who uh, remember their American history, who remembers what happened at Appomattox Courthouse? You remember what happened at Appomattox Courthouse? What happened? The end of the Civil War. Okay, that's where the surrender happened that ended the Civil War. And you have Ulysses S. Grant meeting with Robert E. Lee there. Now, when Grant and Lee come together, Grant has every right, according to our world's customs, to act superior. His army had outflanked, outbattled, and outlasted the army of the Confederates. But Grant decides to do something different. He decides that when Lee shows up to not act superior, he treats him as another human being who has been through hell and back. When Grant and Lee go their own separate ways, Grant lets Lee leave on his own horse to go back home. Grant lets Lee's men leave on their own horses to go back home. Grant sees that these men are hungry, and so he feeds them. And yes, Grant lets them go back to their own homes. This was unheard of at the end of a war between a victor and the one conquered. And so, a few years later, when Robert E. Lee became the president of what we now know as Washington and Lee University, Someone came up to him and, expecting to hear a sympathetic ear, starts bashing Ulysses S. Grant to Robert E. Lee. And Lee stops the gentleman and he says, Sir, at this moment in time, either your tenure or my tenure at this university is about to end, because I refuse to hear Ulysses S. Grant be torn apart. Because Grant gave up his superiority, and treated Robert E. Lee as an equal, as somebody else who had been through hell and back. Lee defended him and walked alongside him. Grant gave up his superiority for the benefit of all. Christ gave up his superiority for the benefit of all. So this Lent and moving forward for all time, let us give up our own superiority, knowing that there is not a set of eyes that any of us can look into that God does not love. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.